So um, good afternoon. Welcome everyone to our History for Lunch for March. Um, I'm going to go ahead and let you know that on Wednesday, April the 5th, um, oops, I skipped the second History for Lunch for March. I am so sorry. Um, it's been a pretty busy morning. But um, we will have a, oh, I know what, uh, we're going to celebrate St. St. Patrick's Day music with um, Mr. Robert Waters on Wednesday, March the 15th. So he'll have some live music here in the auditorium. And we invite you to come out on Wednesday, March the 15th at noon. And then on Wednesday, uh, April the 5th, we'll have the Roanoke River Lights, Beacons to a Century of History. But we are delighted to have with us today, Mr. David Wright. Bal Can you pronounce that for us? Baladay, it's like holiday with an F. Baladay um, with us today. Um, I was excited. We had actually, we had a um, visitor to request um, the book, um, Black, um, Black Cloud Rising, but I know uh, Mr. Faladay from his book also Fire on the Beach, which I still, that's one of the books, if someone new comes to the museum, I tell them this is the book that you need to read. So we're very excited to have Mr. Faladay for Black Cloud Rising, and we are going to get go ahead and get started. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, I am not exactly sure um, like what the format is typically for for the for this this um history for lunch. So what I thought I'd do was, you know, Lori, if this sort of works for you, I, I thought I'd just read a little bit and then just open up the floor to to the conversation. Sure, that will be great. Um we have all different formats. So we'll just go ahead and let you um lead us off and we'll go from there. Okay, great. So I'll just read a, a fairly short excerpt. I think it can be a, a little tedious to have somebody on a computer, you know, reading at you. Um, so I'll read a, a short excerpt, 10 minutes or so from the beginning of Black Cloud Rising. And then what's always most interesting to me, and hopefully will be interesting for y'all, is just a, a Q&A about Black Cloud Rising, about fire on the beach, as any question I can sort of help field, okay? Yes, sir. It's all yours. All right. Um, so I was going to read from the beginning of the novel. The novel, um, um, I, I took it from a very, uh, a sliver of what had been in the, in the, in, in Fire on the Beach, this, I, a story I'd stumbled upon in a, um, as I was researching Richard Etheridge, uh, his involvement in the Civil War, I stumbled on a, a very small book, um, by a man named Vitt that was talking about this three-week excursion from, Tidewater, Virginia, back into Northeast. It is me of, of a part of the film glory that had troubled me. We can talk about that later if y'all want. Um, I, I, I thought the film glory was, was great, but there was one scene in particular um, that bothered me later in the movie when uh, Matthew Broderick's regiment, you know, with Morgan Freeman and... Um, that's all Washington and all of them, they're down in Georgia and they're going out on an excursion, a foray with this other regiment of black troops, but these black troops are literally just off the plantation. Um, they fled and they're there. So they are akin to the group that Richard Etheridge ended up fighting in. Um, but the way that they're presented in glory, when I first saw it in the 80s, they're almost minstrel characters, you know? They can barely march. Uh, they speak in a really heavy dialect. They lacked all the dignity that the uh, that Morgan Freeman and Denzel Washington had. And so I, I remember thinking back in 1988 or whatever that was, if I could ever retell that story, I would. So with Fire on the Beach, when I stumbled upon this very similar regiment of, of soldiers doing this foray on their own, it... it it seemed like a great opportunity. It took 20 years after Fire on the Beach for me to finally write it. Um, but that was a little bit the impetus. Anyway, um, that was a longer introduction than I intended. Uh, I'm going to read from the first pages of the book. Before they set out on this foray to, um, you know, back down to Elizabeth City um, and then in Northeast North Carolina, the command 
commander of the unit, General Edward Augustus Wilde, this northern abolitionist, takes him on this short uh, sortie from, from Fortress Monroe in, in, in Portsmouth um, to arrest a suspected Confederate guerrilla. So I was going to read from that section. It was an Indian summer morn. Yellow jacks like we had out in the sand banks roused alongside the day's heat, petulant and unrelenting, lighting onto whatever skin lay exposed, your cheek, the nape of your neck. And like back home, they bit down to let you know that they'd stopped by, as though the buzzing at your ears hadn't already done that. Troopers swatted at the air despite Sergeant Revere's scornful gaze. I strove not to, to maintain his same air of authority. The distraction ceased as we parade marched past the Princess Anne Courthouse. Old Glory whipped back and forth on her staff atop the white stone building, though it was clear that she was begrudgingly flown. Our footfalls had the cadent boom of thunder. We'd hardly gone 200 paces past, when the court, uh, past the courthouse when the Clapson farm appeared. Across a stretch of unflowered and rustling stems where flax had, had not so long before been harvested. Cuffy. The runaway finger pointed it out. General Wilde raised the one good arm and our column halted, the booming footfalls of a sudden still. Though Neri had turned, all eyes peaked as one over at the plantation house across the way that was our target. Eyes with little texture and no paint. A weatherboard, barge a weatherboard barn stood to the left, a mess of chattel houses to the right. The general had yet to speak word the first. He turned his mount and trotted back down our line, casual-like. Coming abreast of each row, he seemed to take in each man. As he neared me, I noticed that a yellow jack, furry and full, had lit upon his face above the right eye. The man did not flinch as the deer fly did his due. Wilde met my gaze full on. No need fighting the inevitable, said he. Let come what may. Pain cannot last. And he sauntered on. Some minutes later, I heard General Wilde spur his mount and man and rider dash back to the head of the company. He ordered us forward. Bacchus's squad on one flank, Revere's on the other, where the chattel houses were, and mine down the center, straight through the crackling flax. The three lines fanned a half circle around the main dwelling house. Slaves stirred. Some emerged from the barn to take a look-see, even more from the chattel houses, which weren't but shacks with uneven joints and unglassed slits for ventilation. Then, a man with disarranged hair and considerable whiskers appeared at the door of the main house. Clapson for sure, for he carried himself as though proprietorship was his established due. He wore breeches and a long-sleeved undershirt, nothing more, his suspenders not yet raised over his shoulders. And he stepped out onto the broad porch and stared down the general, who'd ridden affront him and not dismounted. Ought other moved. My squad being nearest, I had a box seat view when the general finally spoke. Edgar Clapson, he queried. You know damn well it is, said the other. I'm Edward Augustus Wilde. Brigadier General Volunteers, commanding, he half turned in the saddle and added with a flourish, the African Brigade. We all just stood there at attention. I see your nigger pogey, said Clapson, and I do not recognize your authority. He hitched up the suspenders, an angry gesture, as though they too had vexed his peaceful waking. I command, I command the Tide, Tidewater 12th Home Guard, the Pungo Raiders, and this here is my property. Wilde signaled with an odd and Sergeant Revere, who was nearby, flew up onto the porch in two quick strides and seized Clapson meanly by the shirt and by the nape. Unhand me, said Clapson. Two troopers joined Revere and they forced the man down the steps and wrestled him to his knees beneath the general's gaze. Pogies, sir, Wilde said. Did you say pogies? Clapson would not respond, so General Wilde continued. These men, are, these men are Armageddon's agents, both Gog and Magog. Your world is no more. He turned toward us, the rest of the company. His voice boomed. Guerrillas are cowards and murderers without honor. No better than land pirates. 
and their fate is either quarantine or death. This land pirate's property is hereby confiscated. Seize all men, women, and tykes. Seize the grain and any implements and tools. Fill every hogshead, fill every buckboard. It is all contraband and it returns with us. I broke the men into teams and sent this one toward the barn and that one toward the chattel houses where slaves were still falling out. And what had been puzzlement and gloom now turned to pure rejoicing. I could not know whether my own face showed it, but I was much overjoyed too. I was directing some men loading a handcart with farm tools when I overheard the runaway Cuffy saying to the general, all slavers buck they slaves. His head was bowed, but his voice clear and strong. But this one, he in the habit of stripping him head to heels, gals as likely as men's, whatever the age and for the least offense. And he lay it on sportly. The general's expression did not change, but something was moving underneath. I know of at least one that ain't survived it, said Cuffy. And I noted then what aforehand I had failed to see, a whipping post, well used, standing erect between the dwelling house and the barn. Or what was more likely, my eyes had until then dodged seeing it. I had never suffered the lash, but what slave did not know it? General Wilde, come abreast of Clapson, still disdainful of dismounting, leaned low from his saddle. Even the women, said he, even the women? Revere yanked Clapson to his feet, unbidden by the general, but the order clear. The secesh pulled like a colt then, no one certain what was next. Revere, with a fistful of hair and a fistful of cloth, dragged him toward that upright timber. Shackles hung from its foretop point, and while two troopers wrestled the man's lurching and writhing, Revere hitched him on by the wrists. The yard was dead still, us colored, slave as well as soldier, watching on. Mrs. Clapson's mouth lay wide open, lips a quiver, but no sound came forth. There are three little boys, though. Each one wailed. The general marched his mount to the barn and into it, then returned with a bullwhip over the pommel of his saddle. He rode it over to Revere. Clapson yanked at his wrist, crying to be released, all plea and no protest now. Pungo Raiders, said the general. How quaint. Revere, again obliging some unspoken command, lit the air with that long leather hide. Once and again. Corporal Fields was then aside me, and I'd not heard him come up. Damn, Richard, he said. Damn. It was neither pity nor pleasure in his voice, just blunt astonishment. For who among us could have imagined this? The bottom rail on top, a nigger flogging a legal white man. The general bid Revere to stop just four lashes along. Clapson's head slumped low, his lips whimpering curses. The general prepared to address us troopers gathered around, or so we initially thought. In fact, he was speaking at the mothers. Lady, said he, his voice musical with sympathetic timber, I won't ask that you disclose this man's blasphemies against your virtue. Instead, I present the chance to settle old scores. The yard stood still. Even Clapson's sons had ceased to wail. From the crowd emerged an old mammy, head wrapped in a red rag, cheekbones like straight razors, a burlap dress hanging as long and plumb as her own long self. She crossed to the post, a deliberate stride that made the 30-odd paces seem the damn sight more distant. When she got there, she unfastened a tie and the topmost burlap dropped to the waist. Dugs as, as, as flat as griddle cakes lay like sad folds of flesh against her chest. It didn't seem she retained a tooth in her head. This here, the only virtue of being a Clapson nigger, said she, her voice gravel and as purposeful as her movements. She turned and her back was a tangle of fleshy welts. Ain't all left here to blaspheme, but I expect I might take you up on that score in bit. Mass Clapson's come up is long due. The general took the coiled cowhide from Revere and handed it to the old mammy. She, she let it out along the ground, reckoning the proper distance. Once she settled onto the right spot, the cowhide sang. And then I heard the rest, the other slaves cheering, troopers too. I heard Mrs. Clapson's rejoined wailing, her children's, and the rebel Clapson begging, 
Mercy, Jenny. Oh, mercy. Vengeance can be justice, well-earned and meted out fairly, and yet it be vengeance all the same. The cowhide sang, and I'll uh, stop there. That went longer than I thought. I hope uh, that's all right. Um, so. No, you are completely fine. So if anyone online has a question, we will accept the question through chat. But do we have any questions from our in-person guests today? I'll do one. Yes, sir. Uh, first off, a comment that you brought it to life. I have the book. I haven't started reading it yet. I got to finish another one. But it brought the people to life, and that's just wonderful. Now, Thank my you. The question is, at the end of the Civil War, a number of Black units, including the 36, were sent to Brazos, Texas. I've heard things about, well, Maximilian was causing trouble and wanted to send them. But I've also heard some rumors about, well, at the end of the war, they gave the land for the Freedmen's Colony back to the original people and threw all the women and children off. Now, if they had husbands who were coming home with rifles, that could have been a problem. Have you heard any reason why they were sent to Brazil? Yeah, I think it's more the, uh, and thank you, thank you for your comment I, um, and the question. I think it's more the latter, uh, although not exactly yet from what I, not exactly that from what I've said. So it, it is true that it's going to be a little bit later that they, they sort of, they're wrestling with that question of, of the Freedmen's Bureau and uh, the Freedmen's Bureau and, and the, the former slaves being allotted land and then it's taken back. But in that moment when they first send uh, all the black troopers to basically all the black troopers to Texas, it was a fundamental problem of sort of um, foreseeing a problem with black troopers occupying the South. Right. So they're understanding uh, Lincoln's assassinated. Uh, Johnson's the president and Johnson presidential reconstruction is very uh, friendly to the former rebellious states. And it's at that moment that those troops are, are, are sent south. So in part, it's to get them, Virginia, uh, the occupied south broadly, um, where the black troops are, that's gonna pose a problem. If you have a bunch of armed blacks with you know, their former masters and in, in a society where until recently they had not even been citizens, suddenly they are armed and they are the occupying force. That will be more possible during radical reconstruction a few uh, years later, but during presidential Reconstruction again when President Johnson is super uh, uh, amenable, really, to reincorporating the South back into the fold. Uh, it would just yeah, it just poses a, poses a problem to have a bunch of formerly armed slaves being the, the occupying army. So does that kind of make sense? Point. Um, did you hear that they found Mr. Westcott's grave in Curry Duck? Yeah, second. isn't that amazing? Wait, a second one. There was the one that I know of when you're driving, and then there's a little old black church. There's a graveyard behind it, and he was buried there. There's another graveyard? It was in the first big island crew, and after Richard Etheridge died, he became the keeper. Yeah, yeah, but his grave, the, so, the grave that you're mentioning. He was found somewhere in Curry, though, by an okay. Yeah, I, the, the one that I that I'd seen. And I remember when uh, I wrote Fire on the Beach with David Zobie, when we first went down at the very beginning of the research, um, we had noted this sort of smaller uh, church on the side of the road and we pulled over and it turns out it was an all black church, church. And there's a, I'm trying to remember, it's, um, I'm trying to blank on the names now. Um, it's as you're coming down from Tidewater, what's the name of the, it's nearly right, it's a few miles before you get to the bridge. But so right there, if you're coming, from the north, on the right is a, a an older church. There's a new church beside it that's brick, but you can still see at least then the older church. And in back is a graveyard, and that's where Westcott was buried, because um, that had been his land um, when they first formed the station. Back in the this is digressive, so I won't belabor it. I, I tend to ramble, so I apologize. But when they first during the era of the life saving service, one of the um, requirements of keepers was that they hire men from nearby the station. 
with the P Island station, that was not true because in, because what they wanted to do with the P Island station is they wanted to be sure that there was at least one station that would be staffed by Black folks. And the Black folks who had been in the service at that time had been in stations as far north as there and a few to the south. So with Richard Etheridge in the P Island station, he had him bring all the Black folks from the, from the, uh, from the station. So yeah, Westcott was a little far from the station, but he served there for... 20 years died the died the keeper in the station like Etheridge had. So sorry, that was completely digressive to your question. I apologize. Okay. We do have one comment online. Oops, I'm sorry. Yeah. So uh, the question says, love the book and look forward to your next. Have you had any inquiries about a movie or series based on your book? Yeah, thanks, Daryl. Um, we have, the book is actually, so since Fire on the Beach, way back when, there's always been interest. Um, but I mean, I guess I'm stating the obvious. It's a huge business and we just never got a lot of traction. It wasn't even, it was people would come to Zobie and I, I think maybe in part, well, who knows? Um, but there, there has been interest. With Black Cloud Rising, it's currently under option. Um, whether it goes from that to being in production is a completely different thing. My literary agent um, who, you know, with the, the the movie folks sort of negotiated that that thing. Um, he was like 90% of, of the books that get optioned to be made into films don't actually get made into films. So I'm knocking on wood and, and holding out hope that they will. Um, to me, it seems like, I mean, I, I just think the story is dramatic, but it, it also then spans the Civil War, the Reconstruction, the life-saving service with these dramatic rescues. Uh, P. Island, you know, 15 years along does the E.S. Newman rescue. It's just all this drama. I don't know how that wouldn't make an interesting film, but I'm not a filmmaker, so. <laughs> okay. yeah. So do you have another book um, in the... I do. Um, I am. This is why I was talking to my agent the other day. I'm going to knock on wood, but I'm I'm very near finishing the next book. I wrote a, um, an essay last summer. The book is. I've been working on this book longer than the essay, but I wrote an essay that came out last summer um, called "Mix It." It came out in the New Yorker, and it's about well, it's memoir on some extent, but it, it, it at heart it's about my sort of. Uh, I have a kind of complicated parentage. Um, so the essay is about that. My mom was a Holocaust survivor and she married a black GI after the war, World War II. Um, so she was a GI bride. But then when they were stationed in France again, uh, they had been in the United States uh, before, you know, Loving v. Virginia. So when interracial marriage was illegal in a number of states, they ended up back in France. And while they were there, um, my mother had an affair with her first love, who was this African man. Uh, and that turned out to be my father. I didn't learn until I was 16. But the, the the piece of it that then is the novel that I'm trying to write is that, that love triangle between them. Because the African man, um, so I'm not a character in the novel at all, but this sort of these young people in post-war Paris, a Holocaust survivor, a Black GI, and then a African from colonial, you know, from colonial Africa. He's specifically from Dahomey. And um, Dahomey was called the Slave Coast, because a number of slaves came from there. And this particular, the man who turned out to be my, my biological father, was descended from the last king of Dahomey. So if you've seen that movie that came out uh, a few months ago, the, the Woman King, that's based on Dahomey. And the king that's represented in there is like my great, great grandfather. So I'm trying to tell that story of this love triangle between a Holocaust survivor, the descendant of slaves, and the descendant of slave traders, um, an African descendant of slave traders. So. Sure. We will have to definitely have you back. <laughs> well, I would love to. I would love to. If I'm if I'm right and I'm a little bit lucky, uh, I should be done by the end of the month. It wouldn't be out for another year or so if my agent can place it. But but I'm near finished. So very okay. So um, yeah. do we have any other questions from the audience? I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Um, based on the passage that the author read today fiction. Wondering how typical that was when um, Black Union uh, troops came through and, and came up on farms. I read, I think it was in a, an old newspaper passage that uh, whites in Curtis County, for instance, feared for, um, Camden County, I'm sorry, 
feared for their lives with the approach of Black Union troops. I'm just wondering, based on the author's research, how did what was the routine treatment of slaveholding, white slaveholding families, and non slave That's a, that's a okay. that's a great, great, great question. Um, and so, so first off, just a little context. So when um, when I was doing the research for Fire on the Beach and I stumbled upon the story, like I mentioned, there was just this fairly small book. Um, I think it was self-published by a man named Vitt uh, that basically told the story of the three-week excursion, which I fictionalize here. But since then, when I came back to write Black Cloud Rising, uh, I started in 2016. So after 15 years, more work had been done. A lot of it, a little bit peripheral to this, which is to say about the 36th or about the unit and whatever, more stuff had been done about Black troops in the Civil War. But there's one book that I'd highly recommend. It's an it's an it's a history, so it doesn't read like narrative, but it reads pretty well. It's called The Execution of Daniel Bright. Um, and I dramatize it in the in the novel where Daniel Bright is uh, 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 from, from Elizabeth City, who's... Um, either home on leave or he's active with the partisan rangers with the Confederate guerrillas, one way or another, uh, Edward Wilde orders him hanged, a sort of summary court martial and uh, tries him and hangs him. <clears throat> and that was a uh, uh, devastating enough experience to the region, especially as it was sort of you know done by these black troopers who were back freeing slaves, that this academic historian um, I don't remember his name, but it's called The Execution of Daniel Bright, goes back and revisits that story as a way to talk about the region and the region in the Civil War. So I think you'd really enjoy the book. But to answer your question, from my research, as I understand it, and I try to, 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 to dramatize this in, in the book, when, when, Etheridge, when Richard Etheridge flees the, the Outer Banks, uh, you know, joins up with the, the Union Army, actually joins up on Roanoke Island, and then he ended up being stationed in Tidewater, Virginia. At that point, there's still this big debate about, like, it's super contentious to, first off, to make former slaves part of the, the Union Army, and then to arm them and let them fly, fight. Um, so that debate is still going on as this unit is raised. Um, Edward Wilde takes initiative to arm the troops. They're starting to arm some of the Black troops, but Edward Wilde takes the initiative to do that for his own uh, uh, regiment. There were a few regiments. I reduced them to one for the sake of the story. Um, and so I'm saying that as a way to say, it was super contentious to have these armed black troops in the South, even on the Union side. They're debating whether to do it or not. And it's a few um, um, bold and maybe even brash generals who sort of take the initiative, including not just Wild, but above him, um, uh, Benjamin Butler, who's com in command of that region. Um, so when the black troopers go back, it's really, or go 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 south on the sortie back into uh, the region around, you know, Northeast North Carolina, the region around Elizabeth City, all those counties, their explicit purpose is to confront the, the, the rebel guerrillas. But Wilde knows also that this is gonna be an opportunity to free all the slaves which is what they want to do, what Wilde wants to do. But that also is fairly contentious, which is to say Northeast North Carolina is, it's part of the South, but it's relatively neutral, which is to say the folks in, in, in the Northeast part of the state, some are, the debate is union or not. So some are union slaveholders, some are sympathetic with the, with the, with the rebels, but they're all trying to live in peace to avoid sort of what is about to happen, which is to say the union army white or black coming to the region and taking their slaves and sort of overturning the, the, the order of things as it had been. Um, the troops themselves being aware of that, Wilde also being aware of that, it's a little bit hit and miss. Like, so as I'm, again, I, I don't, or at least if I'm doing my job well in, in Black Cloud Rising, I'm not trying to explain it as much as dramatize it, but if I were to explain it, when they come down, they're hyper aware the Union Army, I mean, including Wilde, who is fairly, I mean, he's the most appropriately named general in the history of the army. Like he literally has a wild streak. Um, he had been a mercenary before the war, a mercenary doctor, but a mercenary all the same. Um, so they want to free the slaves, but they also don't want to um, alienate sympathetic Union folks, they were called Buffalo, uh, I think they were called Buffaloes, where the, no, Buffaloes were the soldiers who, the Union's 
soldiers from North Carolina, but there were union slaves, union sympathetic slaveholders also in the region. They were trying not to alienate them at the same time that they're going to free the slaves. And at the same time that they're also confronting the Confederate guerrillas and they don't know who to sympathize with, like who is on their side and who not. That's a little, I'm a little all over the place. I hope I answered your question. I can be more specific, but I, I don't want to sort of, you know, A, belabor it or bore you. But fundamentally, it's that. They tried to be, the unit tried to be, tried to toe that line to sort of free all the slaves, but not alienate union sympathizers and also confront the active guerrillas and the people from the thank you yeah yeah sorry it was a belabored answer all over the place but yeah hey oops so we do have the museum recently hosted a talk by the author of a new book about um maroons in the dismal swamp how much did you venture in researching their story uh, maybe it was you, Gerald. Someone reached out to me and, and made me aware of that. And I still haven't looked at the YouTube because I'd really like to. And I also didn't, I wanted to look at his name and see if it, I, I'm pretty sure it's the same person. I I researched them through this one person who I think is the, 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 the researcher you're talking about. But I stumbled on the story completely. Um, again, as I'm doing the research, and I got really lucky with the research, which is to say, like, most every incident in the book, the novel, Black Cloud Rising, I pulled from the history. Whenever I, you know, you sort of plot the narrative arc and I've got this outline and I'm imagining what, you know, that I'm going to have to fill in bits and pieces to make the, the novel cohere. But every time I would, I would go back to the history and I would stumble on just really rich incidences. And one was the story of the Maroons. I happened to be, um, I didn't even know there were maroon, a Maroon colony in the, uh, the Great Dismal Swamp, even as I knew the, the unit walked down through it. But as I was trying to sort of I mean, I've driven through there and I had a sense of the landscape as a way to describe it, but I was just doing a little bit more research and I was reading in um, Smithsonian Magazine and there was an article by this professor and there was pictures of him and he talked about how little it had been researched and they cited his book. This was five, six years ago. The book I think is probably from a decade ago and I remember reading it. And so I, I, I the, the Maroons play a, a fairly prominent role in the novel. I don't know that that is actually true to history. I know that the that Wilde and his regiments went south. They did what they did that I describe in the book. But I wanted to find the, the, the story of the Maroons was so rich. I wanted to sort of fold them in. And this is the freedom I had with this as fiction, as opposed to Fire on the Beach, which is nonfiction. So, yeah, it's a really, it totally makes sense that they would be out there, you know, this great dismal swamp and runaway slaves and someplace where they could sort of establish. That happened throughout slave societies in the world. There were often in Brazil, huge Maroon communities. Um, but I just didn't know of any in the United States until I stumbled upon, yeah, his wonderful book and article. Okay. Okay. So, yes, ma'am. I, I just wondered if, if he was aware of the recent discovery in the last year or so that black troops, there were black soldiers fighting in the Battle of Newport in 1862 before anybody, there were any black troops at all. And I didn't. Yeah. Yeah. This Pardon. is very recent. It was, Funny Houston, the Newburgh Historical Society, has just given a talk of William Henry Johnson, a documented Black soldier with the Union troops fighting in Newburgh. And they're, they now think there were more, and they're trying to do further research to find more Black troops. That were there. Harper's Weekly had Harper's shows pictures, illustrations of the Battle of Roanoke. And when you focus in on those illustrations, you see black faces of the soldiers. That's so we have written documentation from him because he was a or, uh, he, he was a newspaper writer. So we have stuff writing, and now we've got the pictorial proof. What what yeah. was the name? William Henry Johnson. Okay. He becomes prominent in New York City. I mean, in Albany. Albany, New York. He goes he's actually right into the harbor in Albany and becomes politically very powerful and active in New York State. Super interesting. Yeah, I'm not aware of that at all. That's great to know. Um, I'm jotting down the name. So another thing for me to, to look up and, and read. Thank you. Okay. And we haven't had the 
the, if we have a historical society, which will be a hundred years old this March, Claudia, they have a their journal, and they'll probably send you a written version of her talk. Okay. Okay. I, I'm sure she'd be glad to talk to you. That's great. That sounds really. The history is so rich, and it's and it's always complicated. I mean, I'm stating the obvious, but it's always complicated. Part of the reason for coming back and writing Black Cloud Rising. Uh, on the one hand, there was a story that I wanted to tell, but part of the re reason for writing it as fiction is there are these things that intuitively just make sense, but the older the history, the fewer the documents, you know, the more marginalized the group, oftentimes there's not documents. So even the story of Richard Etheridge, who was central to Fire on the Beach, I mean, it's really the story about him, the keeper of the this all-Black life-saving station, you know, the Coast Guard part of it, the life-saving service part of it. You know, Zobi and I found his logs, we found documents, we would have loved to find stuff that was more personal, but there wasn't so, so much of that, but we still had all this documentation. As we were looking at it, and what had been known about Richard Etheridge when Zobi and I first started in 1992, was that he's the keeper of the PI Life Saving Station, they do the Newman Rescue, but that's about it. Like you look at the, there's an article from the Coast Guard magazine from 1935, and they talk about PI Island, you know, again, this sort of the only all black station, it's in the Coast Guard magazine. They describe Richard Etheridge as the first keeper. And they're like, uh, they describe him as half Native American and half Black, right? And uh, free, the descendant of free Blacks. And to me, just with what I was learning about the history, this is in 1992, 93, 94, I'm like, it's possible, but it doesn't quite make sense. Um, and so as we do a little bit more research, Zobi and I do, then we figure out, oh, in fact, he was born a slave, right? It's right there, but there's not a lot of documentation to prove it. Um, likewise, his, his service in the Civil War, complete happenstance. To me, it just made sense. He's born in 1842. I do the math. I'd started learning about these Black troops that were raised, these Black North Carolina regiments that were raised. I was like, why wouldn't Richard Etheridge have been part of that? Um, but again, as far as we know from the documentations about his later life, it's not clear. Um, there are pension records then that say, yeah, in fact, he fought. And I'm flipping through a book, uh, a secondary source by a man named Ira Berlin called The Black Military Experience, one of the early books on Black service. And I'm looking through it, I'm flipping through the index, and there's Etheridge in the index. He'd written a letter during the war. So I'm saying all that as a way to say, fiction served the purpose where the absence of documentation couldn't. Like in the story y'all are telling about this man, According to the record, it seems like, you know, Black troops were starting to be raised later, but it makes sense to me. If this, this fighting that is close, that is personal, people who have a stake, uh, yeah, I'm sure there are any number of stories like that that just are waiting to be uncovered. Okay. Other questions? It looks like... Um... Okay. Uh, Daniel Sayers. Daniel Sayers. And, yes. But yeah. um, the gentleman that we had to speak the other week, his name was um, Dr. J. Brent Morris um, from the, you know, um, Clemson University. That's okay. the gentleman he had the other week or the other Friday evening. Okay. It, and it's too rude about the Maroons, but not Morris. Or I'm sorry. Which, which of those two wrote about the Maroons? It's okay, Sayers. So, right, but um, Mr. J. Brent Morris, he was the gentleman that he he wrote a book also. On, okay. Um, it's called Dismal Freedom on the Maroons in the Dismal Swamp, and he was our guest speaker about two Fridays ago, I believe. Okay. Um, here at the museum, but that he wrote about them also. I okay. think it was his book that I read. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, do we have um, other questions? The only question I have, you have books here in your books, um, We, uh, she um, has sold out. We do have Fire on the Beach, but the book seems to be very, very popular. So she has sold out before the event, um, but she does have more. She has ordered more, so we should be getting them soon. I'm and super believe, glad to hear that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> sold out. So I, I believe that the book um, was in hardback, but now it's in paper or it's. Yeah, it, it comes out in hard, it came out, came out in hardback in February 22, and then it just came out in paperback a few weeks ago. So, 
Yes, but um, yes, the book, your books are very popular here at the Museum of oh. the Albemarle. So, oh, um, but you, yes, sir. Just for a fun thing for you, uh, at the Wilson Library at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, they have a slave dialogue written by, a, we don't know what he was in Senegal. He may have been a prince, but he wrote it in Arabic. And the hmm. documents are very, very fragile. And I think yesterday, for the first time, they've been put on display. But this is the only slave document. I think he wrote a number of documents, all written in Arabic. And he's brought to Charleston, and then he escapes, and somehow he becomes a house servant in Fayetteville as a, you know, as a slave. And he writes all this biography in Arabic. It's fantastic. <laughs> that, so that sounds it's great. Just for fun, you know. Is it um is that the Southern Ibn Historical Sayed. Collections? Ibn, Ibn, he asked you a question. What sorry? Yeah, sorry. Is it at the Southern Historical Collections at the uh, UNC? Yes, yes. That's great. Wilson, I will check that out. Wilson Library. The Wilson Library, yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's it makes a certain sense. There's a book called, I mean, slaves came from a number of places, but they were the slave trade was very deliberate in in who it was taking. For instance, um, I'm going to refer to a couple things. There's a book called, or it's a documentary film called, "The Language You Cry In." Um, it's from 1999, and it's further south, like in, it's in the Gullah part of uh, South Carolina. But it basically tells the story of it's sort of serpentine, long winded. But it basically tells the story of this this woman who was born in the the 40s who remembered her, a linguist had studied her. And so the documentary follows the linguist, but she was born in the forties. And she remembers as a child, sort of singing, singing this song that was kind of gibberish to her. Um, this linguist though, thought that he could make a connection between the song that this person remembered, you know, he recorded it in the sixties or seventies when she's older. Um, and he does, he traces it back to a specific place in Sierra Leone, region of Sierra Leone that this song was traced back to was where they grew rice, where they grew rice and indigo. And the planters in that part of South Carolina were growing rice and indigo. I'm saying that as a way to say um, another book that might interest y'all. So that documentary film, The Language of Crying, which is wonderful, but a book that might interest y'all came out probably 10 years ago called um, Dreams of Africa in Alabama. And it tells the story, it's been talked about a lot lately, but but the last slave ship, um, there's a documentary about it too, landed in Mobile in 1860. So right before the war, the slave trade's illegal. But because it landed in 1860, in the 1930s, when uh, the uh, AW, uh, the, the, the program that hired writers and journalists and stuff like that during the Depression, I'm drawn up, the WPA, um, has folks go to the South, they record a few of these slaves who were still alive, former slaves who were still alive in 1935, one in particular called Kudjo Lewis, who remembers, because he was on that ship in 1860, and he had been 17 or 18. Um, so he has this memory of life in Africa, and then also of the Middle Passage, and then a slave. This book talks about it, the documentary does too. So those stories um, are rich and are, are out there. And is it this is why I got on this tangent. Sorry, I, I, again, I tend to ramble. It totally, on some level, it totally makes sense. Um, there were a number of, uh, of, of Africans who were enslaved who came from Arabic-speaking Arabic countries. So my great-grandfathers, the kings of Dahomey, um, they're towards the south uh, of West Africa, towards the coast is where the, 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 the kingdom was established. But they slave raided way north. They slave raided almost to the Sahara. So a lot of the slaves that they sold had been Muslim, right? And if if you're like Kudjo Lewis and you're on that ship and you arrive in 1860, you remember your sort of Islamic culture and language and whatever, and Islamic culture being uh, literate. Uh, so yeah, that he would have write that in in Arabic makes total sense. You know, it's super interesting. Can, can you can you just Give the name of the documentary you were speaking about tonight. Yeah, the documentary, I'll type it in chat, but if you're not online, I'll, I'll say it too. It's called The Language You Cry In. Um, and yeah, I don't remember the director, but the the 
the way to get a to 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 rent or get a copy of it is through the California Newsreel. That's the the distribution company, California Newsreel. But the, right. the documentary is called The Language You Cry In. And the more recent documentary uh, that just came out this fall that basically tells the story of Kutcher Lewis and this last slave ship that lands in Mobile that came from the slave coast is called, I think it's called The Last Slave Ship. I mean, it's that straightforward. Um, I've heard of that, so. actually. Yeah, I've heard of that. I hadn't heard of the documentary. Yeah, yeah, really good, really good, good really wonderful. So I think um, more questions. I think we are good. This has been an awesome yeah. discussion. Um, it's been different from um, past uh, history for lunches, but I think the interaction with guests um, through chat and in person has made this a little bit more personal um, history for lunch. And we want to thank everyone for coming out today. Thank you for coming to thank us. Thank you all. Hopefully. I think yeah. University of Illinois, so um, we are quite a distance apart today, so several hours, but anyway, thank you to everyone, and we hope to see you on March the 15th. Thank you for coming out. Thank, thank you, you all. Thank you very much. All right, then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.